On International Women's Day, the U.S. women's soccer team is taking another step in the fight towards gender equality as all 28 members of the U.S. women's national team have filed a gender discrimination lawsuit against the United States Soccer Federation. This coming just months before the team sets off to defend its championship title at the 2019 Women's World Cup in France. For more on this breaking story, we bring in our legal analyst, Michael McCann. And Michael, three years ago, we saw five women's national team players Players file a wage discrimination complaint with the EEOC. What has changed between then and now, and just how does this escalate the conflict? Sure, Amy. So a few things have changed. One is that there is now a collective bargaining agreement that's clearly in place. There was some dispute. There was a separate lawsuit back then involving uh, uh, the, uh, the issue of their employment. Uh, that's been resolved. They have signed a collective bargaining agreement with U.S. soccer. So that's one change. And then secondly, the EEOC issued a right to sue letter, which enabled the players to file a federal lawsuit. And those are some of the, the major legal changes that have taken place. Uh, of course, there have been other changes in terms of the play of the players. They've continued to play very well. Uh, and, and many would argue they're much better than their male counterparts. We know they're set to defend their World Cup title this summer. What does this mean for their World Cup this summer? Is there a chance that the team possibly doesn't make the trip to France? I don't think so, at least right now. From, from what I can tell, their complaint really is about going through the legal process, filing a lawsuit that will likely take quite a while to play out, conservatively months, but this is the kind of case that could go on for years. So this will not be a swift resolution. It's probably not going to be over by the time the World Cup starts in June. So it's more likely that they're taking the long game and their attorneys are very seasoned antitrust attorneys and labor law attorneys. They know that these cases can take a while. They also know that U.S. soccer will bring some defenses forward, including that there's a collective bargaining agreement, that the argument will be the players agreed to these wages by contract, that even if there are pay disparities, they reflect the willingness of the players to agree to them. That may sound harsh, but that's an important legal argument that U.S. soccer will bring up. And then U.S. soccer will also argue that even if there are paid disparities, there are other legal explanations for them. At least that's what they'll claim. So it will take a while to play out. So people may point to the difference in compensation, facilities, resources, et cetera, as well as the relative success of the men's and women's teams and think this lawsuit is a no brainer. But what is the burden of proof on a gender discrimination lawsuit and, and what might complicate the outcome? Yeah, Amy, you're right. All of those things appear to be true, that the women players are much better relative to other players who they compete against versus the men's players. And then secondly, the facilities pay, all of these things are, are, seem to be much better for men. But that isn't necessarily the legal test. The legal test will be, do all of those things reflect gender discrimination? Is there actual evidence of discrimination beyond the disparity? Is there evidence that, that it's, it reflects discrimination? And, and similarly, are there other reasons that could explain it? For instance, does this reflect the number of games that they play? Does this reflect television contracts? Does this reflect merit in terms of what male players globally are worth versus women players who are playing soccer? And the argument will be that it's not gender discrimination intentionally, that it turns out to be discrimination because of the marketplace. So, you know, it, it's a case that, that could raise some, uh, could, could cause U.S. soccer to have to raise some awkward arguments. Some of the players involved in this suit are not only the stars on the women's national team, but are some of the most recognizable female athletes in the world. Carly Lloyd, Alex Morgan, to name a few. Does their star power help or hurt their cause? Oh, I think it helps their cause because these are recognizable figures. So to the extent U.S. soccer argues, well, you know what, at the end of the day, male players are more noteworthy if you look at the amount of attention that they garner over the, across the world that overall TV ratings are higher and things like that. Well, the, the argument to offset that is that, no, the women players are actually much bigger celebrities than the male players, at least in the United States. And I think it's helpful for the players to have their most, most marketable figures to the extent that these are figures that the typical sports fan in America recognizes. That helps them. And also, they're demanding a jury trial. Now, I don't think this will ever get to trial. These cases almost always reach a resolution before them. But if it does get to trial, 
I think it would certainly benefit the players that they put up figures that a juror could say, wow, I, I know who that person is, or at least I'm aware of them. They really are stars. Why are they being paid so much less? It could only mean discrimination. Is it possible that this lawsuit could impact women's sports more broadly in the U.S.? I think it could. I think it raises really what appear to be pretty, uh, pretty terrible pay disparities. And whether or not they reflect a marketplace or whether they reflect discrimination, it's clear that there are substantial pay disparities. And, and a lot of sports fans may, may say, well, you know, male sports generate more revenue. They generate more attention. I don't know if that's true here. I mean, that's the, this is the sport where the women players are much better relative to their competition than the male players, at least in the United States. So it, it sort of is important because it's the narrative that disproves some of the common critiques you, he you hear as to why there are pay disparities. You know, between WNBA players and NBA players, you can say, well, that's because the NBA is more, more, much more marketable. They're much more, there's more celebrity power, more endorsement power. I don't think that that's true here. So it's really interesting to see if it leads to broader change. Yeah, a, a very fascinating um, development in this case. I'm sure we'll continue talking about it. As you, as you said, it's going to be a long time before we see a resolution here. Michael, as always, thanks so much for breaking it all down for us. Thanks, Amy.